So today is Wednesday, March 3rd. Our recording is on. It's the 11 a.m. section. Uh, today, we are going to focus on the next stage of historical analysis, which is the ROIC trees and the CFIs. Uh, this will be covered in lecture note four, which is what we're about to do. Uh, so looking ahead, I just want to mention that um, on the 2 p.m. class today, uh, United Airlines will be our special guest for that one section. Um, I've been doing some work with them and uh, one of their teams is actually focused on improving their millennial experience and, and trying to drive uh, passenger volume in that way. Uh, basically, uh, I asked them if they wanted to come and talk to the class. They said, sure, they'd love to, and they'd like to actually engage with the class to get some feedback, almost like a mini focus group, uh, as they work through their millennial project. So during the two o'clock section today, United's gonna be here, some very senior leaders, so this is some actionable stuff. Uh, they're going to kind of educate about the section about the airline and just have a conversation. So if you have some thoughts and ideas you want to share with them, uh, you're welcome to join the two o'clock link uh, and, and hear that section. But otherwise, what we're going to focus on today is to prepare you for next Wednesday, uh, which is your second group project presentation. And again, uh, this one is going to be on historical analysis of a company. So let's go ahead and pick up with that and talk through that. But before we do, I wanted to quickly mention how we're doing in our Bloomberg Trading Challenge, just as a quick check-in, because uh, we're nearing our six-week mark. And as of today, for the 11 a.m. section up, this is how we stand amongst the teams. So again, everybody met the 10 long threshold. In terms of available cash, everybody's met the minimum cash balance. I don't count, but again, tougher markets. Uh, we see four teams are now in the red. Uh, leading team is up by 5% portfolio return. And that's just kind of your relative ranking compared to your peers as of today. Hopefully you're using some of the, the tools and tricks that we learned in our Bloomberg guest lecture to help you track and, and analyze these companies. Obviously, it's a little bit more challenging market when the market doesn't go straight up all the time. But I uh, just want to give you a quick look at that. All right. So let's launch lecture note four. So what's uh, important about these converted statements that we have been talking about is we're gonna try and understand the past to help us with our view of the future, okay? But remember the past doesn't always guarantee the future. We're gonna try and understand the past as we go and eventually go to the next stage of the class after uh, spring break, which is when we'll come back and talk through forecasting, and then the DCF, enterprise DCF that comes in that uh, perspective, right? So what we have learned thus far <clears throat> is how to remap statements into an economic format that balance. And again, I gave the solution video you should have watched on Monday, which is kind of like a detailed solution on, on how to do the, the conversion. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to address them. We're happy to talk about that. Um, but again, what I want to now talk about is once we have put the statements into that format, how do we analyze it? And that's what we're going to go through today. And so there's going to be two things we're going to talk about. The first are what we're calling ROIC trees. My sharing is not working. Uh, the first is going to be called ROIC trees. And then the second is going to be called the CFI analysis, for lack of a better word. So when we do ROIC trees in a second, we're going to tree out the ROIC and, and basically there'll be two levels of analysis that we're going to go through. These are all the drivers of ROIC. So on this next slide, we're going to then talk through the drivers of CFI. Okay? So there are four sections of CFI, 
free cash flow, non-operating cash flow, debt equity flows. And so again, we're gonna explain how those change to get a better understanding of the company. Okay, so those are the two types of historical analysis that we are about to go through. Okay, so let's start out with <coughs> McDonald's and we'll look at McDonald's historically. So this is kind of older data, but uh, wanna get a sense of how McDonald's is doing during this five year look back or five year period of time, All right? And actually, I need to switch this to PowerPoint. My apologies. So I don't want to draw on the screen. And I can't draw in this one. Start share screen. Okay, Scott. All right. So during this historical period of time, this is McDonald's, what we call ROIC tree. And as we go through the tree, first thing I, I want to point out here is this is going to be based on EOI or end of year ROIC, right? As opposed to BOI ROIC. So in your homework assignment, we did the, value, the uh, conversion on BOI. Here, the data is based on end of year, which means current year, no plat divided by current year invested capital. And it's a five-year look, okay? So from 2010 to 2014, this example. And so the final number here is this is a five-year percentage change. So the way to think about this is in a five-year look, McDonald's ROIC went from 21.8% to 18.9. And so what the tree does is it helps us understand the changes in ROIC for a company. And so what I mentioned on the previous slides, <coughs> is that when you do an ROIC tree analysis of any company, there are three drivers of ROIC. Always three drivers, always the same drivers of ROIC. And that's what we're gonna to start to talk about. So the first driver of ROIC is right here. And that is the cash tax rate, okay? So that's gonna affect ROIC. Second driver is operating margin. And the third driver is invested capital to sales or productivity. And those three drivers explain the ROIC. So when you do your analysis, whether it's the writing for the homework that's going to be due on Monday, or whether it's the PowerPoint that your team is going to be presenting next Wednesday, you're going to have to talk about these three drivers and how they explain the change in end of year ROIC. So as we go through the tree, we're going to work from left to right, and then we'll eventually summarize by going right to left. So first driver is cash tax rate. So McDonald's ROIC went from 21.8% in 2010 to 18.9%. That was a 14% or 13.6% decline. Why did it go down? Okay. Well, the first driver is the tax rate. In 2010, McDonald's tax rate was 29.3%. In 2014, McDonald's tax rate was 35.5%. So they're paying more in taxes. Do you think that helped or hurt their after-tax ROIC? Hurt. hurt. So that's the first driver. So the first driver is that the tax rate going from 29 to 36, rounding off, the 21% increase in taxes over the five years led to a decline in McDonald's ROIC from 21.8 to 18.9. That was one of the reasons why it went down, okay? Now, <clears throat> as we get started with this analysis, I also wanna mention, I'm gonna keep the training wheels on. <laughs> so we're just gonna do the beginning and the end. Eventually you're gonna be, and by eventually meaning next week, you're gonna be responsible for the middle as well. So it's not just the first and last year, we're gonna also eventually talk about the journey. But for simplicity, we're just gonna start with the first and the last year. So it went down and taxes was one of the reasons you're paying more in taxes. But even if we pay more in taxes, take out the tax impact, we're left with a pre-tax ROIC. And the pre-tax ROIC, the underlying operations of the business, it was making 30.9% in 2010, fell to 29.2. So taxes alone do not explain the drop in ROIC. The pre-tax performance went down as well. That's what we see here. 31 to 29. So drivers two and three explain the pre-tax ROIC. 
So mathematically, let's do a little algebra here. This times this equals that, okay? So what's actually happening here is operating margin is profit divided by sales. That's operating margin. Invested capital divided by sales. If I multiply by sales over invested capital. Just doing a little bit of algebra. Equals, S's cancel out. P over I C. So the point is ROI, ROIC, if I break it out, is P over S times S over IC, profit over sales times sales over investment. Okay, so <clears throat> that's what these two formulas are. <clears throat> Operating margin is profit over sales. This is P over S. And this is technically S over I, except I'm doing the reciprocal I over S. Now, the reason why I'm doing the reciprocal is that in the real world, companies think in terms of sales, they don't think in terms of investment. And so I wanna keep it consistent. So since this is per dollar sales, I want this to be per dollar sales. So technically what I'm actually doing here is I'm taking P over S times one over the reciprocal of S over IC which when I rearrange, <clears throat> sorry, I C over S, one over I C, it's supposed to be I C, I C, there's the eraser here. Let's try it again. So actually on the screen is one over, this is IC, hard to write with your mouse, divided by sales. So this is just the reciprocal equals P over S, right? And so the reason why I'm, I'm doing the reciprocal rather than this is just for consistency that sales is in the denominator. Right, because this is tax divided by sales, profit divided by sales, capital divided by sales, just for consistency of the math. But this times one over this is that. But the important thing about this multiplication right here in the middle of the screen, sorry, mouse problems, is that multiplication sign says that they have equal weight. They're equally important in determining your pre-tax ROIC. So why did the pre-tax ROIC go from 31 to 29? Well, the operating margin went from 31 to 29 as well. Does that help or hurt the pre-tax ROIC? That hurts right. it. Yeah, exactly. So one of the reasons why the pre-tax ROIC went down is you're making two cents per dollar or less of operating margin over the five years, right? And then the third driver is how much are they spending on capital? So I see the sales. Here's how I want you to interpret this number. In 2010, now I'm down here, Damn it. That's why I don't like PowerPoint. In 2010, to generate a dollar sales, McDonald's spent on invested capital a dollar. Dollar sales, dollar of investment. Right? In 2014, to generate a dollar sales, they spent 99 cents on capital. Is that better or worse from an ROIC perspective? 2014, is 2014 better or worse than 2010? Better because they're spending less to make a dollar of sales. Exactly. So that should help their ROIC. So the reason why their pre-tax ROIC went down was because of which of these two drivers? Operating margin. There you go. That's what you need to start to understand about these drivers. So at a top level, and I'll call this the first level of analysis, McDonald's pre-tax ROIC went down over a five-year period from 21.8 to 18.9. Got to use numbers in your analysis because of a drop in tax rate, or sorry, 
a drop in ROIC caused by the tax rate going up from 29 to 35, 35 and a half, right? And that caused the pre-tax margin to go down from 31 to 29. And the reason the pre-tax margin went down from 31 to 29 is because the operating margin went from 31 to 29 as well. And then the invested capital improved slightly from a dollar of investment to sales to 99 cents. So they got one penny of improvement in productivity, but that was not enough to offset the 2%, two cents per dollar drop in operating margin. That's what explained their drop in ROIC, drop in margin, drop in tax rate. Questions about that? All right, now, now we're gonna to go to the, what I'll call the second level of analysis. The operating margin over here is a function of these three things. And specifically, it's your gross margin minus your SG, minus depreciation equals operating margin. So these are the three income statement drivers on the right that lead to your operating or EBIT margin, okay? So that's what's gonna explain it. What we have to do is we have to explain why did we go from 31 to 29 in the income statement? What caused it to go down? Well, let's look at the first item. Gross margin went from 45 to 61. All right, that's a big difference in gross margin. Remember that's price minus cost of goods sold. These are your gross margin. So second driver is SG&A. That's, people call that overhead. They went from spending nine cents to 26 and a half cents. Okay, it was a big jump. And depreciation as a percentage sales went from five cents to six cents. A little bit higher, kind of hurt it, but not as dramatic as these two. Now here's the next thing. I told you we're looking at the beginning and the end, but the middle is important. So look at the five years, 45, 45, 62, 62, 61. That's their gross margin. SGNA, 9, 8, 25, 25, 27. Do you notice a weird trend? It's almost as if, yeah, something happened in 2012, almost as if like, I don't know, they did an acquisition or something, something that substantially changed the structure of their revenue exactly. and income. So, so something really weird happened to them between 2011 and 2012. And, and so one is, did they completely transform McDonald's? So do you, do you think McDonald's completely did some giant acquisition and changed its business? You guys probably eat there. Not that you probably you recall, because that's not the case. So what actually happened was an accounting reclassification. I love the accounts. So what they did is they moved things that previously were in cost of goods sold, and they moved them to SGA. Okay. So the problem that we're going to have in doing the analysis this way is that 2010 is an apple and 2014 is an orange on the income statement. So we really can't compare it. It's, it's hard to do, okay? So what is more comparable is 2012 to 2014. So this is another example of why we have to look at the intervening years because it's these three years that become more of an explainer of driver of what's really going on in McDonald's. And between 12 and 14, their gross margin went down a tiny bit, 61.7 to 61.4, basically virtually unchanged, okay? Their SGA went from 25 to 26 and a half. That went up a point and a half. And their depreciation went from 5.4 to 6. So really the 31.2 to 29, which is really 12 and 10 are about the same, really occurred between 12 and 14. And it was primarily not the gross margin, but it was the increase in the SGA by about a point and a half from 25 to 26 and a half. And the half a point of depreciation from five and a half to six, that's two points. That explained the drop in the operating margin, okay? So the real drop in the operating margin was spending on SGA. okay? So a little historical context of what was going on with McDonald's. This is when McDonald's started to have trouble when people started questioning whether or not McDonald's was healthy and they stopped going to McDonald's nearly as much and McDonald's was having problems with sales. So McDonald's was spending a lot of advertising dollars to convince you that you should still keep coming to McDonald's. 
but it wasn't translating to higher sales and profits. And that's what you saw playing out here on their financial statements in the trees. Questions about that? All right, now we're gonna try and explain the second level drivers or the balance sheet. Because invested capital sales, which is TFI, is based in the balance sheet. And these are the three balance sheet, okay, that's mouse, drivers. Working capital, PP&E, intangibles, which is goodwill. Those are the three major items in operating invested capital. So working capital is the first one. You add these three up, working capital plus PP&E plus intangibles. These three add up to be invested capital of sales. So that plus this, plus this equals this, okay? So again, I'm gonna take a five-year view. Working capital went from negative two cents to basically zero between 2010 and 2014. Are they spending less or more on working capital between 10 and 14? If it goes from negative two cents to zero, they're spending more? Yes, even though it's zero, they were getting negative two cents of working capital, which means they had more liabilities than assets. Now they're equal, so they're essentially spending more. So that is one of the reasons why invested capital and sales worsened, because working capital went against them by two cents per dollar. PP&E is property, plant, equipment. at your buildings, land, equipment. That's the McDonald's, the stores, and the stuff inside them. That went from 91.6 cents of spending per dollar on PP&E to 89.5. Did that help or hurt? That would have helped them? Yeah, they're spending less on their stores, the stuff in them. And intangibles, which is spending on goodwill and acquisitions, went from cumulatively 11 cents, 10.7 cents to 10 cents, which helped a little bit. So they didn't really do a lot of acquisitions. Right. And they got a benefit of working capital, but that kind of offset how much they spent on PP and E because they saved two cents here, but they spent two cents more on PP and E that's netted out. And then they spent about 0.7 cents more on intangibles. That's why or 0.7 cents less, but that's why you're seeing the slight improvement in invested capital sales. So a little bit of savings intangibles, savings in PP&E offset by the increase in working capital. Second level drivers for the balance sheet. Questions about that? All right, so now I work backwards. Why did the McDonald's ROIC go from 21.8 to 18.9? Because in the income statement, the drop in the operating margin from 31.29 was caused primarily by the rise in SGNA from, from essentially 25 to 26 and a half over this three year period. You got about a point and a half of SGNA was the primary driver of the drop in the operating margin. Productivity for the balance sheet stayed about the same, slightly improved, mainly because of the reduction in tangibles, which overall led to a decrease in their pre tax ROIC from 31 to 29. And when you couple that with paying higher taxes from 29 to 35, led to the overall ROIC going from 22 to 19. That's what you have to say in your write-up using numbers. That's what you have to say in your presentation when you analyze a company next week. Questions about the ROIC tree? This is Chipotle, the burrito place. So same period of time. How's Chipotle doing? We kind of walk through the analysis from left to right on a five-year basis. How's their ROIC? Better. Because it went from to what? 26.6 to 40.8. Which was a... How, what percentage change? Quick math. 
It's actually right. 53.3%. Five year change. So that five year change is to help you. So you don't have to do the quick math, but you're doing great. So taxes, first driver. Did the taxes, the change in taxes help or hurt Chipotle during the five years? Because they went up. They went from 38 to 37, six as a tax. Oh, right, went down. So that should have helped them. So one of the reasons why their pre their after tax RYC went up is because they paid essentially 1%, half a percent lower in taxes. So is that the primary reason their RYC went up so much? Probably not. Clearly not. It's the pre-tax <laughs> RYC, which went from 43 to 65. It's the pre-tax. But the tax rate did help them incrementally a little bit, but it's pre-tax that's the primary driver. Okay, why did the pre-tax go up by 43 to 65? Was it margin or was it productivity, invested capital sales? Which of those two helped them? The invested capital of sales went down by a lot, which helps them. From 0. 0.365 to 0. 0.264, so a 27.5% difference. Which helps them. So just make sure you use numbers when you say that, but you're absolutely right. So the, the, the invested capital sales, I'm spending 26 cents per dollar on my stores. I used to spend 36 cents per dollar to invest in my stores. I'm investing a lot less. What about the margins? The margins also did help them. Uh, they were making 15.7 cents per dollar of sales. Now they're making 17.3 uh, cents per dollar. So that's a 10.4% improvement. It does help them. It's probably not as big of an impact as they invested capital though. Well, but overall, they both had pretty big impacts. They both helped them. And so that was the point. The pre-tax went up because of both better margins and better productivity. At the same time, they were paying slightly less in taxes. They were kind of firing in all cylinders. This was pre-E. coli to Portly. When people used to flock there and, and be feel safe about eating their food. By the way, compare and contrast this with McDonald's during the same time period. Was McDonald's having the same story as Chipotle? No. Definitely not. There you go, and you're benchmarking. McDonald's was having no big increases in productivity and their margins were going down. Chipotle's margins were going down and, the, and or up and the more they sold, the better their productivity got. These were like the good old days for Chipotle when their stock was skyrocketing. We kind of get an understanding of why. So in this five year period, why did their operating margin go from 15.7 to 17.3? What changed on their income statement? Now I'm at the second level drivers. Now we're over here. What changed at the income statement level for Chipotle? All three drivers went down. Okay. The gross margin went down from 0 0.304 to 0 0.299. Uh, their SG&A went down from 0 0.110 to 0 0.099 and their depreciation went down from 0 0.038 to 0 0.027. Do all three going down help the operating margin? No, you want gross margin to go up. Okay. But so, the down, the decrease in gross margin wasn't um, like it wasn't that much to offset the decrease in SGA and depreciation. Which those decreases because they offset it led to the increase of the operating margin. Yes. The puzzles fitting together. That's what you guys got to do. You got to connect those dots for me when you do your analysis. So good job. Those are the right dots to connect. That's how you connect them and you use numbers. What about the balance sheet? Why did the productivity go from 36.5 to 26.4? Looking at the right, that third, second level drivers. 
Why did it go we down? See, we see major reductions in all the categories. Their working capital went from 1.6 cents per dollar of sales to one cent. So we see, uh, again, 0.6 cents saved there. We see pp &E went down from 36.9 to 26.9. Uh, and our intangibles went from 1.2 per dollar of sales to 0.5 per dollars of sales. Um, so, I mean, they all went down. It looks like the biggest impact from a dollar scale is from the pp &E. It went down 26.9%, but that's off of the large base, 36.9 cents to 26.9. Right. So let me, let me mention a couple things. One, be careful about the percentage change. They're there to help you with directions, but magnitude matters. Mm -hmm. Meaning the drop of pp &E from 36.9 to 26.9, 10 percentage points had a much, much bigger deal than to drop from 1.2 to 0.05, right? So even though it's a big percentage change, it's a half a cent. So the real productivity was the PPD to sales. The other thing is watch the negatives. <clears throat> when you go from a negative 1.6 to a negative one, it's actually not a decrease. Oh yeah. It's actually an increase. So they were spending a little bit more on working capital, 0.6 cents. But they saved 10 cents per dollar on pp and &E. So if you got a couple more you know, burritos hanging around, whatever, <laughs> you're doing really good on your stores. And you're making 2 cents more per dollar in everything you sell. So the market's not going to care that much about the working capital being negative because the, the store productivity was doing so well. Does everybody see that? Questions? Just one question. This is kind of a basic one, but can you just explain quickly um, how to interpret operating margin? You said it's um, like for every cent earned, it's. EBIT divided by sales. That's operating margin. So it's every time you sell something, how much operating profit or EBIT do you make? Okay, so thank you. So higher is better, right? And what drives EBIT? Gross margin minus SG&A minus depreciation are the three major components of EBIT. So proxy for cost of goods sold, SG&A depreciation. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? I have a question. For operating uh, working capital to sales, can you just give like an like example for just like Chipotle, I guess, of how like the 2010 to 2014, it would decrease? Well, <clears throat> working capital, again, you can go back to your balance sheet, but it's primarily three things. It's gonna be accounts receivable. It's gonna be inventory. minus accounts payable. That's basically working capital. Now, it also includes operating cash and a couple of other items, but these are your core components. So to have negative working capital, that means you have more accounts payable than receivables and inventory. Makes sense, thank you. So that's what's happening in Chipotle. Now, here's the thing. If I have <clears throat> less accounts payable, less than versus what I did before, then I still could have negative working capital. I just have less negative working capital because I'm paying a few more suppliers. But they're still using their suppliers to finance their receivables and their inventory. That's what the negative one cent or negative 1.6 cents says. There's more of this liability than there is of asset. Now in your accounting textbooks, <clears throat> They used to talk about how you want to have more assets than liabilities. <clears throat> but in the real world, if the banks are willing to let you finance this, and if the vendors are let you, willing to get the payments without any penalty, why not let the vendors finance my inventory? Right? Why do I need to finance the inventory? Let the vendors finance the inventory by waiting until I sell it before I pay them. <clears throat> That's one way to kind of keep my cash commitment a little bit lower. Right? A little bit more fi financial risk, 
But the flip side is I don't have to lay out as much cash myself to finance that part of the business. Most companies don't have negative working capital. It's more of an exception. Let's go to more current. Walmart. Walmart through 2020. How's Walmart doing in the last five years? In the retail business. They've seen a drop in their end of year ROIC from 12.8% to 10.6%. Why? That's right. Why? Let's their end of year pre-tax ROIC has dropped from 18.4% to 14.1%. Okay. So a big drop in pre-tax ROIC. And they have seen a drop in their tax rate, but it, um, I don't think that that is enough to offset the drop in the pre-tax ROIC. Because the pre-tax did go down from 18 to 14. So, so it did go down, even with the taxes benefiting them when they went from 30 to 24. So the real reason the after-tax went from 12.8 to 10.6 to is because the pre-tax went from 18 to 14. Why did the pre-tax go from 18 to 14? Primarily because of decreases in operating margin from five cents per dollar of sales to 3.9 cents per dollar of sales. Um, although also it is worth noting their invested capital to sales also went up. They were a little bit less productive. Uh, yeah, their productivity went down a little bit, but it looks like the primary driver here is their operating margin. Great. And why did their operating margin primarily go down from five to four? which when you're a $500 billion company, that, that's a big deal. Why? They saw drops in um, their gross margin from 0.27 to 0.26, and their SG&A costs went up a little bit from 0.201 to 0.208, and their depreciation costs also went up a little bit from 0.020 to 0.021. But what's the main? Of the three, what do you think took, had the biggest impact? I think the drop in gross margin probably had the biggest impact, either that or the increase in SG&A costs, because that one seemed to go up the most. Well, gross margins, three basis points, three-tenths of a percent. SG&A is <clears throat> seven basis points, 0.07 percent. So SG&A. And is 0.01. It's, it's SG&A. They're spending a little bit more to get you to come in and buy their stuff. Why their balance sheet productivity gets slightly worse? 0.27 to 0.29. What happened to their working capital? The working capital decreased from 0.5 cents per dollar of sales to 2.3 cents per dollar of sales, which is, I get it. <laughs> Because it's a small number, we see again at 300 days, 7.4%. But I mean, at the end of the day, the working capital got slightly better, uh, improved by about 1.8 uh, cents per dollar of sales. Right. And PPE uh, spending on facilities and the actual stores, the super centers, and the Sam's Clubs? Looks like it pretty much stayed exactly the same 0.242 to 0.242. So why, if, if the working capital got better and the PPE didn't change, why are they less productive? The intangibles went way up. Okay, in what year? They went from three, five to five, nine, but where was the big jump? 2018 to 2019. Because it went from? 0 0.036 to 0 0.061. Which suggests to you what? They probably acquired another company. So when Professor Perfetti asks his question at the end of your presentation next Wednesday, what do you think the question might be? What company did they acquire? Exactly. This is the other half of this analysis. Like, yes, you do the math, but your team, and I expect you since these are real world companies, like when you notice these anomalies, you should start to understand why there's an anomaly, right? So if you see a big jump in intangible, suggest they bought somebody, who would they buy? That should be immediately jumping in your mind. If you see some big change in a year, 
why was there a big change? Was there a problem that they had? Were they doing an acquisition? Were they doing restructuring? Something in the marketplace? You know, the analysts are talking about this. The company's talking about this. You know, do a little bit of your homework, but but that's the point. Like my questions are going to come out of this as you do your analysis. It's going to be the same ones you're going to look at. If you see a really weird number on here or a big jump, I'm probably going to ask you about it. Those are the sources of my questions because the real world, these would be what the analysts would be focusing on too. Same five years, Costco. Costco's end of year ROIC went up from 18.9% to 22.4%. And it looks like their pre-tax ROIC did go up slightly from 28.2 to 28.8, but the biggest jump is the decrease in tax rate from 33.2% to 22.3%. So we'll stop right there. Costco's different. Costco's not going up because Costco's better. Costco's going up because the taxes actually mattered to Costco. That drop in tax rate was almost all the reason why Costco's ROIC is better. They really benefited by the tax cut. Pre-tax business didn't change all that much. It got a little bit better. Look at their operating margin over five years. Costco's like a clock. Wall Street likes Costco because you can pretty much sleep through your analysis. Oh, they made 3% again. What are they gonna make next year? 3%. What are they gonna make next year after that? 3%. Like they're just consistent, right? This, this is basically an easy company to analyze and forecast because they are so consistent. Actually, that's the criticism of Costco is that they, they feel that they should be charging more that their margins are, are consistently low and they're giving away too much at lower price. But that's their business model. Their business model is why I like Costco personally. Because when you walk into a Costco, you're going to buy a bunch of stuff you don't need. It's going to be bigger than you want, but you're going to get a good deal on it. Like they, they just don't mark up stuff extreme. They're not trying to take advantage of their customers. And, and that's why I think the customers flock to Costco. Because you kind of know that whatever you buy there, you're paying a fair price. And, and they're just... They're, they have their margin and they're okay with that margin. And that's what they sell year after year after year. So here's the point. If I got a low margin, look at their balance sheet, invested capital sales. Again, very tight ranges at Costco, 11 to 10.8. So as you go through their analysis, there's, there's really not a lot of differences in Costco to explain. You're talking about some real nuances here, right? You go to the McDonald's during that four year period of time, there's dramatic changes that were happening in McDonald's. You can start to see that. So get a sense of, of how we do. All right, questions about the tree, the ROIC, how we look at it, how you need to analyze it, what you need to practice. And when I talk about the analysis, start left to right, identify the three drivers, make sure you use numbers, then you go to your second level analysis, what drives margin, it's the income statement drivers, what drives productivity, it's the balance sheet drivers. And finally, it's just a final summary. Once we've done this, why did this go up again? This was the key income statement driver, this was the key balance sheet driver, work your way backwards. That's your analysis and understanding of the company. Statement number two, go back to McDonald's, CFI. So, over the last week, we've learned how to convert income statement and balance sheets into CFI. So these are the converted balanced CFIs, okay? So I'm gonna give you a balanced CFI. And by balanced, as you know, if it's not balanced, you know there's a problem with it, okay? So these two numbers should be the same. So how do you analyze the CFI? Well, it goes back to Medigliani Miller. These are the four buckets that you wanna analyze. Operating, non-operating, debt, equity, one, two, three, four. So an analysis CFI are these four buckets, okay? But we deliberately start with the first bucket, which is free cash flow. So where we start with our CFI, start right here at free cash flow. That's where you're going to start. Okay. 
Now, this is operating. These are your ones. Now, here's the thing. Five individual years. So we're going to do a five-year look back. The total is just the sum of the five years. You're just summing them up. So for, for simplicity for this analysis, like I said, we're going to start with explaining the total column. But as I said, with ROIC, with the training wheels, we're on the total column. But by next week, you're going to be also looking at the intervening years for any major trends. All right. So start with free cash flow. Start with your ones. And here's the point of free cash flow. If a company has a positive free cash flow, basically your analysis is going to be, what did they do with it? because we know that they're going to either put in non-operating assets or they're going to pay off debt or equity. If the free cash flow is negative, then the, the whole analysis is where did the funding come from? They either had to draw it down from non-operating activities or fund it with debt or equity. So we start with free cash flow, not just because it's the value, but it tells you how you're going to do your analysis. So if free cash flow is positive, why is it positive? And where'd the money go? That's your analysis. If the free cash flow is negative, why is it negative? And where'd the money come from to finance the very negative free cash flow? That's your starting point when you do a free cash flow analysis. So McDonald's has positive free cash flow. I'll get rid of the pens here, just because it's hard to see as I overwrite this. Pen. Right. Positive free cash flow of $23,916.6 million. Round off $24 billion. Okay. So over five years, why? Gross cash flow is $35.5 billion, $35.4659. So that's cash from the income statement. So they made $35.5 billion of cash from the income statement. Gross cash flow minus gross investment is free cash flow. They put back in 11 billion in working capital and pp and &E and reinvestment, capital expenditures, which means their reinvestment rate was 31.7%. What's the payout rate? What's the theoretical payout rate of McDonald's during these five years? Would it be 68.3? It would just be 100 minus 31.7? Yeah. So theoretically, if they're paying out, they're, they're reinvesting 32, they could pay out 68. Okay. Now, here's the thing. If you don't pay it out, where does it show up? If you don't pay out your free cash flow, where does the cash go? Retained earnings. On the cash flow statement. Where does it go on the cash flow statement? Where does it go on your CFI? If you make free cash flow and you don't pay it out, where does the cash go on the cash flow statement? Excess cash? Yes. It's primarily excess cash. So that's the point. Excess cash is just free cash flow that hasn't been paid out. That's actually the definition of excess cash. So back to <clears throat> McDonald's, they have about 24 billion of free cash flow left to pay out. Now there's actually two definitions of, of free cash flow that Wall Street uses before and after acquisitions, right? So if you look at the free cash flow from the business, it's 24.2 billion. You could then technically use this as an operating activity to, to buy other companies. So goodwill premiums are investment activities in an academic sense. So free cash flow before and after goodwill, before and after acquisition premiums. McDonald's, 300 million in acquisition premiums. They didn't really do a lot of acquisitions, not over the five years. So almost all the 24 billion of free cash flow became the free cash flow, 23.9, running, selling burgers, that they're then gonna then distribute within the firm, okay? One other key point as you talk about this free cash flow section and the investment rate is the ratio between 
CapEx and depreciation. Okay. So the rule of thumb for depreciation on a straight line basis is what? If, if you have an asset that has a 10 year life, how much is depreciated each year on a straight line basis? If I have a 10 year asset, how much is depreciated each year? Just its value divided by 10. All right, why? What are we trying to represent there with one tenth of the value being lost every year? Just conceptually, what are we really trying to represent with that straight line depreciation? If I lose a tenth of my value, why am I writing off a tenth of my value every year? Conceptually, why am I doing that? I'll give you another hint. Why is the depreciation subject to the matching principle? What's the matching principle? In accounting. What's the matching principle in accounting? Expenses are reported in the same period as revenues. So if I'm spreading it out over 10 years, why am I matching it over 10 years? If an asset has a life of 10 years, at the end of 10 years, it's worth nothing. What am I really saying when I write off a 10th of the value every year? You're writing off how much of you like the cash that you paid for it goes like is almost like already used in that year. So like a tenth of its value, a tenth of its cash value is used in that year. Exactly. Just common sense. It wasn't a trick question. That's common sense. It's kind of what you're doing. Everybody can see that. So let me ask you this. If we then put back in one tenth of the value every year and we're writing off one tenth of the value every year to stay neutral then basically what we're doing is we're kind of maintaining what we have. We're maintaining the status quo conceptually. Would everybody agree with that? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to think about the ratio of depreciation to capital expenditures. So if your capital expenditures equal your depreciation, you're trading water. You're basically replacing what's wearing out and then I want you to think about that in the context of a growth signal. If I'm treading water, I'm just spending what's wearing out. Do you think I'm intending to grow? No. No. What would be intent to grow? If you're replacing more than what's wearing out. So or replacing that is more than depreciation, that's a growth signal. Yes? Yes. Yes. Wait, what happens if you spend a lot less on CapEx than depreciation? Your closing locations probably, or just, you know, you're shrinking. Um, you're not trying to probably, grow. Yeah. Okay. Look at 2010. <clears throat> look at 2010 and look at CapEx to depreciation. And tell me what the signal McDonald's was selling, telling investors about 11 and 12 that they were intending to grow because their CapEx was 1,805 and their depreciation was only 1,276. What about 2011? Same thing and probably even a little bit more. And so 2012? Same thing and even more than the year before. And 2013? They're still same. intending on growing, uh, but it looks like the capital expenditures did go down a little bit. And 2014. Way down, that they are not intending to grow. I am telling you that if you were following this as an analyst, you knew in 2014 the McDonald's had problems in 2015 before they told you they had problems in 2015. Because this is hindsight, but basically they slashed their store expansion. They're not, 
They didn't, they stopped expanding stores overnight. And it's pretty clear <clears throat> that they did this because they were worried about sales. And if you put this in context, this is the same time the operating margin is falling and the productivity is worsening. So I'm telling you the storm clouds for McDonald's troubles a few years ago were starting to show up on their statements in the CFI. And they were signaling it because their reinvestment rate was, was 30 to 40% as a percentage and all of a sudden went to 10. And they weren't even investing depreciation. There's a reason they did that. They had too much stuff relative to sales because there's usually a lag between pp and &E and sales. So that's just your other indicator as you go through your CFI and free cash flow. Why do we have free cash flow? <clears throat> What's the reinvestment rate? Gross cash flow, gross investment. And what is any signaling that we can discern out of what they're doing with their depreciation against CapEx? Now, <clears throat> continuing on with McDonald's, that's section one. Section two, we go to the non-operating cash flows. How did they get from 23.9 to 24.7? We're looking at the big items. On a five-year basis, really, they got a billion 97 by basically selling off their non-operating assets. I don't know what, what the non-operating assets they got rid of, but it generated almost $1.1 billion worth of cash, right? Had a loss of 151 million, they basically increased their excess cash by about 188 million. But the real reason why the cash flow to investors was bigger than their free cash flow is they really got a billion 97 from non operating cash flow by reducing their non operating assets, whatever they were, getting 24.757 of CFI to be paid out. Okay, so now how did they pay out the 24,757? Well, positive numbers are payouts. Billion 730 was paid out in interest. Makes sense, gotta pay interest on my debt. What does this negative 4411 of debt tell you? What did they do with their debt? They increased it, so they took on more debt. Okay, so this has been a consistent midterm question that I've asked, or final exam question I've sometimes asked. It, with this data, did McDonald's need to borrow the debt? Was this debt necessary? No. No. How do you know that? We already see a significant amount of free cash flow from their operations. Um, they have of how much? Of, I guess, just from their operations, their free their free cash flow, and not even looking at the non operating is twenty three point nine billion dollars. <laughs> So they don't need $4 billion worth of debt. Right. So they're clearly borrowing this money for non-operating purposes. They're not using it to fund CapEx. They're not using it to fund inventory. That's clearly funded from sales. They didn't do any acquisitions. So I want to come back to why do they borrow all this debt? So let's keep going. The next big item we see on the financing side is they paid out $14.2 billion worth of dividends and they repurchased $13.6 billion worth of treasury stock. What is 14 plus 14? 28. How do you pay out $28 billion to your shareholders if you only have 24 billion to pay out? By taking on $4,000 in debt. And paying off the proceeds from the, from the debt issuance. That's that's what the debt was for. <clears throat> they borrow the debt to buy back the stock. Very clear. Now, I don't begrudge them for this. Why not? Take advantage of all-time low historical interest rates that the banks are willing to give it to you. Why not take advantage of it? But they're not using that money to go make more burgers, buy more stores, because basically their business is actually starting to struggle. So they bought back their stock. And this is actually another reason why I don't like it when people say, oh, I buy back my stock because I have confidence in myself. No, you have confidence in yourself, invest in yourself. 
put the $4 billion into more McDonald's franchises. That's confidence in yourself. Buying back your stock is not confidence in yourself. It's a distribution to shareholders. Now here's the point. Why am I distributing to shareholders? It's not about, I have confidence in the future. I'm spending less on stores than I used to, not even maintaining my depreciation. What I'm really doing is I'm trying to buy back a depressed stock price. I'm manufacturing growth and earnings per share that doesn't otherwise exist because basically I don't actually have the operating cash to actually drive the value of the performance. So in the short term, sure, I, I like cash. Don't get me wrong. I'd rather you give me the cash than waste it, but this is not sustainable. So this share buyback is not a signal that McDonald's is the company I wanna come in as an institutional investor and buy long-term. This is a short-term payout. It dries up the earnings short-term. When I kind of look through the business itself, I don't see the operating performance getting better and that's why I'd still be nervous and I'd take the cash buyback, I'd probably go buy Chipotle. Questions about how I'm making those assumptions? What was happening at Chipotle? Let's look at their free cash flow and CFI. How are they doing over this five year period of time? Where did we start? Start at the free cash flow. 970 million of free cash flow. <laughs> right? <clears throat> because they had a billion eight of gross cash flow and 900 of gross investment and a 48% average reinvestment rate. What was their signal in 2014 about potential growth? They seem very optimistic. They seem to be carrying that optimism from past years, 46.6% reinvestment rate. Uh, although it is a slight decrease from 2012 and 2013, it's still you know very high. Yeah, but they're they're putting 250 capex on 110 in depreciation. Yeah. So that they seem to be thinking that the growth is going to continue, not knowing that E. coli was about to hit, <laughs> rear its ugly head. <clears throat> so how they how they turn 970 million into 140 million of CFI to pay out? What'd they do with their cash? Because the free cash flow went down and they only had 139.7 to actually distribute. They, they bought non-operating assets. Of 400 million and? The rest of the cash they just sat on, they just increased their excess cash balance. Yeah, they increased their cash balance by $436 million. Right, because they were just making so much money, they didn't even know what, they couldn't pay it out fast enough. Why does any, increasing uh, their excess cash decrease the cash flow available to investors? The metaphor that I used in the video, and I'll just basically just it helps me think about it, is think about it like a checking account and a savings account. So the checking account is the account that I use to pay my bills. So if I take money out of my checking and I put it in the savings. I have less in my checking to pay my bills. That's what's happening with excess cash. So, okay, so when you draw the money out, you're basically setting it aside. You're reducing what's left to pay to your bills, to your creditors. Okay, so the cash that they just don't do anything with, that is just cash that's just sitting there and it's not really like available to go anywhere? Well, it's technically available. They're just not putting it anywhere. They're putting it okay. in a account earning 1%. Okay, thank you. Liquid. Now the opposite is true. So if I raid my savings account to pay more bills, then I'll have a decrease in excess cash and my CFI will go up. Okay, so this is kind of tracking what are you doing with your excess cash? But in this case, they didn't pay it out, so it just goes to excess cash. Did anything go to the debt holders? I mean, pretty much no, because they, they have a clean balance sheet. They don't really have any debt. So what they do with 140 million? They bought back um, shares of 290 million. Sorry, they paid dividends of 200 million and they repurchased, they issued shares, should say, of uh, 290 million. 600, sorry, 600 million to buy back shares of 293. So they were issuing and repurchasing shares. Now I might say, this doesn't make any sense. Why would a company issue shares and then buy back its shares. 
what started to happen is companies were issuing options to their employees at a pretty good clip. And so there was a conversation that caused investors to worry that they were getting diluted. So what some companies started to do is when they issued options, they would inoculate the shareholders by basically buying back issued options to employees. They would basically buy back a, a similar amount of shares so that it wasn't really diluting the share count. Okay? And, and Chipotle was basically doing that. They're basically buying back stock to fund their options to management <coughs> um, <clears throat> without diluting the stock. Right? But regardless, this was a company that was, was kind of firing on all cylinders. Let's go to more contemporary. What can we say about Walmart over the last five years? They have a very big free cash flow at 64, is that million? Billion. Billion, 64 billion. Okay, why? And it looks like um, in 2020, their <clears throat> capital expenditures was 26 billion with a depreciation of 10 billion, which indicates that they are um, definitely optimistic about growing. And that's way bigger than 2019, which was actually indicating that they were shrinking. So that's a big jump. So by the way, if this were the real class next week and you were doing Walmart, I would probably ask a team, what happened in 2020 that caused Walmart to spend so much money on CapEx? What did they spend it on? What do you think? Well, their investment rate went from 32 to 94. So it looks I know, like- what, Exactly, but what, what happened in the real world? What, were, what, the, what are they spending all this money on? I imagine primarily due to probably online infrastructure because of COVID um, and just all the changes that resulted from that. I don't know if like specifics uh, during research. Well, this was actually where I'd look. Pre, pre starting to COVID, but here's the point. It's called Walmart Plus. So you're seeing it today. Like they're trying to compete with Amazon. Exactly right. They're spending a lot of money to build their, their ability to do an online business. It was showing up in their spending. Okay. So that, that would be the relation to the real world. All right. But that, that being said, okay. Big investment, reinvestment rate, 94% last year. They've averaged 39%. Obviously, most of it's starting to go to e-commerce activities. What did they do with the 64 billion of free cash flow? How did 64 turn into 48 of CFI? How do we get from here to here? What'd they do primarily? They bought um, non-operating assets. Almost 11 billion. <laughs> And, yeah, we and the six billion dollar non-operating loss. All right. So, what non-operating asset did they invest in? This is pretty substantial. We could go look it up. What did they do with the forty-eight billion? How did they distribute it? They paid out eight point four billion in interest expense. We saw them take out. 26.8 billion in debt, which again, look at their free cash flow. That wasn't necessary, but they chose to take it out. Um, and why? Yeah, it looks like primarily again for, yeah, uh, yeah as you highlight there, um, in order to give out dividends and also to buy back stock. Uh, so same story. Billion as, of dividends, 3784 mm -hmm. and 34 billion, 33833 of share repurchase. Basically in order to pay out $64 billion to shareholders, they didn't have 64 billion, they only had 48. They borrowed 27. That's how they could afford to do this. So again, a lot of companies the last few years have been leveraging up their balance sheets. You could clearly see that Walmart was no different. <clears throat> and they also have some minority shareholders, which is related to this non-operating investment. And basically you can see that they paid out two and a half billion of minority shareholder interest, dividends to minority shareholders, and they increased their minority shareholder stakes by 2.3 billion. So they bought, another piece of another company. I don't know who it is, but they made a big stake in some other companies. So there's just some things that they're also doing here on the financing side, different than the operations. These aren't stores they're controlling. These are passive investments, passive income. Okay, then we go to Costco. 
Costco, again, the predictable company. <laughs> 11 billion in free cash flow, no acquisitions. Pretty consistent, well, last, last couple of years, 48% reinvestment, 21 billion of cash for the income statement, 10 billion of cash reinvested, that's the 48%. Basically CapEx, much higher than depreciation, they're still opening stores. What do they do with 11 billion of free cash flow? Basically it's 10 billion of CFI to be paid out because they put about a billion three in excess cash. 491 million of interest. Again, they borrowed 1.8 billion as well of new debt, paid out 9 billion of dividends and 2 billion of shares. How does 11 pay out 10? That was the difference. <clears throat> but what's also interesting is if you look at the five-year trend, just the consistent year by year increase in gross cash flow as the business becomes ever more profitable consistently as they grow, just consistent growth, consistent cash growth, more and more free cash flow <clears throat> over time. They're just a money making, you know, turn that crank every year. Very consistent. See it in their numbers. All right. Questions about any of this? I had a quick question. Yes. Um, from a strictly analytical point, how could you reinvest um, 105%? <clears throat> reinvest. Yeah. So for 2016, the reinvestment rate or the investment rate was 105%. Does that mean that you're investing more than you're making? So you're yes. taking out debt as a part of the investment? Yes. Okay. Now, now but, but here's the point. It's, it's a good question because if you go into perpetuities, you can't have more than 100% reinvestment in perpetuity. Like okay. the banks won't let you overinvest more than you have. <clears throat> so you're kind of capped in perpetuity. You, you'll never get to 100%. Yeah. But in the short term, there can be some, like in 2016, a little bit of an anomaly, but the mm -hmm. anomaly is right here. They put 3.8 billion and they only had 3.6 billion. So they clearly had to borrow money to finance that year. Okay. Thank and the you. way they borrowed money is they raided their savings account. They drew down their excess cash by a billion seven. And that's actually how they financed the 2016 overinvestment because they had cash reserves, but they reduced their cash reserves. Okay, but yeah, that's a really I, good call out. So good insight on that. Awesome, yeah, because I noticed that they didn't pick up any debt that year. So I was just curious how they were going to make that money. Yep. Well, they didn't. This is the proxy borrowing. Yeah. They needed savings because they had the savings to rate. If they didn't have the savings, they would have had to borrow money, and that was the right thinking. Where did the money come from? Because that's the point I want you to start to understand. When you have negative free cash flow, intuitively you should be saying, "All right, where did they get the cash from?" I should be seeing the money coming from somewhere. Traditionally, it would be borrowing. In the case of Costco, they, they kind of borrowed from their savings as opposed to getting it from the market that one year, right? When McDonald's did it, they borrowed it from the market because they didn't have the cash on hand to pay out all that debt, more debt. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. All right, so your homework assignment due Monday uh, is going to be on Target, okay? And basically you have the data, it's individual 500 word write-up, minimum word count matters. It's the first thing TAs are gonna do is they're gonna open it up and if it doesn't have 500 words, it's gonna get a zero, no matter how many words below, you get 498, you're still gonna get a zero. Second thing it's gonna do is you're gonna submit it, it's gonna go through, turn it in. So any plagiarism is gonna be flagged, so do not plagiarize. And if you're quoting anything, then make sure that you uh, footnote it or bibliography it. So basically think about half the word count approximately should be the ROIC tree walkthrough. Make sure you use numbers. If you don't use numbers, you're not gonna get credit. And then the other thing is you're gonna do a CFI walkthrough of target, okay? The tree and the ROIC tree and the CFI are there as part of the assignment, okay? That's Monday. That's an individual assignment. We'll talk about it in class, we'll practice more. Wednesday is your next team assignment where you're going to do a 10 minute presentation on this stuff to me. The company your team is going to be analyzing and presenting is General Dynamics. So I will put up 
the GD ROIC tree and the GD CFI. So if you want to start simultaneously helping each other by working on your presentation, that's what you're going to present next Wednesday for a grade in class, 10 minutes per team. Okay. But Monday, individual assignment, target, write up, CFI, ROIC tree, like we did today, submit, and then we'll talk about it during class on Monday. Questions about any of that? Um, I have a quick question. Yep. I think that the um, files on the homework assignment right now are not actually accessible. I will go check those out, make sure that they are. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and again, this has been recorded, so I'll post a video. Remember, TAs have office hours the next two days. And as I said, if anybody wants to drop by the two o'clock class to learn about United, uh, you'll, you'll feel free to come as a guest. Otherwise, have a safe week and I will see everybody next Monday. Have a good day. Thank you.